I do want my work to be accessible. I want poetry to be accessible to everyone. I'm not interested in the elitism that surrounds so much of just the arts, but especially poetry. Your most um, recent book is A Quilt for David. Uh, it was published by City Lights in San Francisco. And the book is based on the life of uh, a dentist, David Aker, um, who in 1990 was accused of infecting his patients or some of his patients with HIV. Mm -hmm. The case uh, generated a lot of uh, media attention. One of the most uh, vocal patients, uh, Kimberly Bergalis, ended up uh, testifying before Congress. You were in eighth grade when, uh, when these events happened. Uh, did you know about this case at that age, or when did you first learn about uh, David Aker? David Acker. Acker, Acker. Actually. David Acker. Yeah, David Acker. I was in the eighth grade, and after school, I would watch a show called A Current Affair and another show called Inside Edition, which were these like tabloid media shows. Um, that were popular at the time, kind of like TMZ, but without celebrities. And uh, Kimberly was on it quite often. When you have a diagnosis of AIDS, it doesn't mean that you're gonna die. Um, it just means that you're faced with a challenge, you know, a challenge to, to live each day. It was such a scary thing to see in the eighth grade um, as I was kind of coming to terms with, you know, kind of knowing that I was gay, and at that time, being gay meant automatically that you had an AIDS sentence, you know, that you were just bound to, to get AIDS. And so that's what I thought was ahead of me in the future. And when did you have like an interest to, to take this story and make it into a book? When did that happen? For 10 years, I worked as an HIV test counselor and educator. So, and I did that in the state of Florida and in the state of California. I, because sorry, this case happened in Florida. <clears throat> yeah, this case happened in Florida. Okay. And one of my best friends died of AIDS-related illness. And towards the end of his life, I tried to be his caregiver. And I was way too young and couldn't handle it at the time. And soon after that, I think I just kind of felt like, um, you know, the, what is it, like the safest Part, you know, being in the eye of the storm is actually the safest, safest place. place. Yeah, and so I then worked in the HIV field. And so after being in the field for a while, I, I then moved to California, and I started thinking about this case. You know, after knowing so much about HIV mm -hmm. transmission and giving presentations at, natu at national conferences, I thought, like, what did really happen in that dental office? And so I started researching it, and I was really surprised at the homophobia and AIDS phobia that was just saturated in everything that I read about this case. And so just out of natural curiosity, I started to investigate. You started in two th it's, uh, 2008, the, the research process, and then in 2012, you ran an ad in a local paper in Florida uh, looking for people that knew uh, David. This uh, could be an example of uh, investigative journalism, but I think you call it um, investigative poetry because with all the data you collected, you didn't write a journalistic piece, you wrote uh, a poetry book, uh, a quilt for, for David. What I didn't want to do is create like Wikipedia entries with line breaks. You know, <laughs> I, I, I wanted it to be factual, but also interesting. Yeah. One of the reasons that having a factual piece of work was important is that this case was already loaded with so much misinformation that I didn't want to add to it. So I don't really take poetic license or fictionalize anything or have any of my own like musings that are a part of it. I just wanted that if you read a detail in the book, for the reader to know that that's a detail I encountered through my own research, <laughs> through whether it was the uh, personal interviews from the mm -hmm. people I talked to with the ad in the paper or things that I had read. Why don't we um, listen to a couple of uh, samples from the book? There are no titles in the poems, they're like a one big piece. 
but the first line or the, the opening line is a patient said you uh, and then the other one is educated to heal. A patient said you weren't talkative but nice. You would go out of your way to save her office copies of People magazine. Eight months after your death, the weekly magazine's headline was about you. Educated to heal, to provide comfort, to treat injuries of the mouth, there is one you couldn't handle. The soul chaos soar on the roof of your mouth. Soon there were four. On an evening in May, you carried a dental a carterary home, an electric device that cauterizes wounds. In the dimly lit bathroom mirror, you used it to singe your palate. Red hot electrical heat on wet tissue repeated the procedure, burning each lesion. Dentist, heal thyself. Something that was surprising to me as a reader is that there's a lot of um, uh, information from the, um, from the uh, patients. You know, they, they gave the positions, but there is very little from the dentist. I think you, uh, you have in the book or in the preface like eight lines of, or that he, he wrote from his uh, hospice uh, bed. And that's all, uh, that's all the voice we have of him. Yes, and that's all that I could find. Um, that's incredible. Unfortunately, yeah, although if we think about it, this is late 80s, early 90s. 90s. And so people aren't as documented now that if you know you want to find out information about someone, you can find them on social media. There's so much uh, documentation that's kept. Uh, I did try to talk with his family, who actually didn't give me much information, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Also, for his friends and associates at that time to talk about knowing David means that they would have to out themselves. Yeah. And in a small conservative town like Stewart, Florida, that's not something that people were necessarily interested in doing. So the only words that I have of David's are from that letter that he wrote from his hospital bed, which was then published in the newspaper. They paid for a full page ad where he encouraged his patients to get HIV tested. And he said that he um, discovered that someone accused him of infecting them with HIV and that he doesn't believe that he's responsible. And he said um, it would go against everything he believed in. Yeah. It's such a sad and heartbreaking letter. And especially to think about that he did it just days before he died, that he was literally lying in a hospice bed. Yeah. Also in that moment, his name wasn't on the door of the hospice. He went under an alias. So at the beginning of his diagnosis, he would see doctors using an alias because he didn't want to be found out that he was a dentist, a healthcare provider with, with AIDS. Because that would have been the end of his career. Correct. Yeah. It also could have been the end of his social life. Yeah. You know, yeah. what little he had of one as a closeted gay man. And so at the beginning of his illness, he had aliases. Then when he was dying, he was out and open and came out to his parents and to his family. And then towards the end of his life, he had to go back to using aliases. And I think like how heartbreakingly sad to live with such secrecy and shame and fear, especially mm -hmm. at the end of at the end of just such a short life. With all the media attention, I was surprised to learn that um, he was never interviewed or anything. Kimberly Bergalis I think had a press conference the day after David died. So that was the time that she became public. So before that, uh, it was anonymous in terms of who this person okay. was who was claiming to be infected by her dentist. There is one section in the book that, where, that starts with the description or the opening about the office of David. So do you mind reading that poem? Sure, I'd love to. The office where you methodically took time with patients, seeing only eight a day, briefly became a nightclub. Club Envy had an all-ages night. Kids younger than the age Kimberly was when she was in your chair, 
moved on the dance floor. Young girls undid top blouse buttons as soon as their parents dropped them off, rolled up their shorts on the dance floor, sweated under black lights and mirror balls, kissed with straight white teeth, pressed their bodies together. They know nothing about history. They barely know the music the DJ spins. They'll leave the club round the corner in the humid Florida night, smoke cigarettes in the lot where your patient's parked. Maybe they'll drink from a flask that's been hidden in a young man's cargo shorts pocket, take gulps outside the window patients once looked out from. They know nothing of you or how hated gays were back then or what AIDS meant at the time. They can't possibly imagine what it was like for a man trying to make a living with a deadly virus, for eight others with a deadly virus looking for someone to blame. The young kids come every week for the music, the lights, the energy, flirtation, and the bodies moving next to them on the dance floor. Kimberly must have felt something similar at college, dancing to late 80s music with her girlfriends, flirting with men, smoking pot, tasting cocaine, maybe unbuttoning one more button on her blouse. Barbara said she was the original hippie, did she love to dance too? John was a partier. Richard might have enjoyed a tune at the jukebox. Lisa likes her Harley and heavy metal. You went to discos in Germany and Fort Lauderdale. How drinking eased your awkwardness enough to dance and hit on men. All of you is innocent as the revelers at Club Envy. No one could have known when they danced in their youth what was to come, how what they felt couldn't be bottled or captured or kept, that a virus would harm them all. A quilt for David has uh, many layers. There is the layer of the, the accusations, the stigma, um, also the dangers of unquestioned uh, narratives, um, medical details, and, and also the pain of secrecy. Many of these layers pay attention to what we say and what we don't say. Uh, the th I think the theme of uh, secrecy is also present in, in some of your previous work. Uh, what is hidden, uh, what is deleted. Um, so there's one particular poem in Inheritance that uh, talk talks about this, about uh, editing or deleting. Uh, would you mind talking about the poem and uh, reading the poem? Sure, definitely. And, and I love that you, of course, as a poet, picked up on this um, in terms of, you know, I, the poetry that resonates the most with me is when poetry is saying the unsaid. And so my previous work has been almost all autobiographical and kind of sharing the secrets that I felt encouraged to keep growing up in my household or in my community. And it's interesting, though, I thought this book was such a big departure because it's not autobiographical <laughs> work. It still, it still has that element, that quality of um, saying the unsaid. So this has, um, this poem is called Auden's Edit, but it also has a note for those who don't know that um, after the first printing of the war poem, September 1st, 1939, Autumn decided that it was trash and rereading the line, we must love one another or die, he said, well, that's a damn lie. He's like, we must die anyway. And so he omitted the phrase and uh, that was really captivating to me. So that was the inspiration for this poem. I wonder why he omitted it the omitted line more powerful than the entire poem, a gem published fully after his death, and engulfs the other words, lines, stanzas. Maybe it was expurgated to be used elsewhere, but never had. And so we find this line, this orphan child, not knowing why he abolished it from its home, left it a strike through in an early draft. Auden wrote, then edited, we must love one another or die. A truth so sweeping, one would think there could be an exception, a falsehood about it. 
but there isn't. It stands there in all of its opulent truth, waiting for us to realize, waiting for us to notice. Indifference towards others is a four-star general in the army of war, and Auden, with his mightier-than-pen sword, wrote how we could find salvation, how we could escape the death and killing of war. We must love one another or die. So you just read a poem from uh, Inheritance. Uh, Inheritance is actually your, uh, your second uh, full-length uh, collection. The first uh, book or the full-length uh, is, uh, is uh, Dead Body is My Welcome Mat from 2001. Uh, also, you have published uh, more than 10, 10 chapbooks. Um, and um, I have a question about all the previous work. Did your writing change uh, when putting together this book? Yes, I think my writing has changed over time. And just hearing that title again, uh, which is Your Dead Body is My Welcome Mat, that book was published when I was 25 years old. Uh -huh. And I feel like that's such a great title for a 25-year-old's <laughs> book. And uh, because it was filled with such angst and anger and... I think it comes out in that work. I think part of being so young uh, was also being, um, I mean, dramatic has such a negative connotation <laughs> to it, but, but maybe that was it. I mean, I think that like, you know, younger people regulating their emotions isn't their strong suit. And that was probably true of myself and definitely on the page. And I think that I'm significantly calmer. And I think my work reflects that calm and it also reflects you know when we're able to slow down we're also that's where insight happens and so i think that my work has always been dynamic but maybe the later work is definitely more insightful and i write a lot compared to what is published i'm also a very slow you know at, at this rate i'm like a, a book every 10 years a collection every 10 years and I'm okay with that because I'm very proud of the work that is published and out there. And, and if it doesn't feel right, I'm not so interested in it, in it being out in the world. Um, so, yeah, so that's one way the work has changed. Also, you know, kind of what we talked about before that my work was always autobiographical. And so now I'm writing about other people's lives in, in the collection of Quilt for David. And, you know, there are times I, I do insert myself into this work. There yeah, are times that I, like the poems I've read, where I address David directly. And that that was something I, I went back and forth with. And I, I had difficulty doing that. Thankfully, I've had a lot of generous readers. Hmm. Um, and David Trinidad, a poet who I remember first reading in the high risk anthology. And then after that, I sought out like everything he had published. <laughs> and uh, he thankfully read A Quilt for David. He's the one who gave me the name for it, which is from a poem, because I kept struggling with the name for the collection. But he also was the one who encouraged in certain poems my inserting myself in that very, um, subdued way. Your language uh, is always um, approachable, inviting. Uh, it's not like quotation marks, complicated. So you keep that tone a little bit. You keep that, that tone from the previous work. I do want my work to be accessible. I want poetry to be accessible to everyone. I'm not interested in the elitism that surrounds so much of just the arts, but especially poetry. And I think that since poets and poetry are so undervalued, I think that it, it can create some feelings of insecurity or inferiority in poets. And so they resort to, um, they, they resort to tactics <laughs> that I think exclude others. And it's a way of kind of creating some emotional space and distance. But I'm not so interested in that. I really feel like poetry saved my life. And it's one of the mm great loves of my life, and I just want to make sure that more and more people are experiencing it. Um, also, your work has a, 
a public dimension in the sense that you were the poet laureate of uh, West Hollywood. I think the first poet laureate. The first, yes. The first yeah. one, 2014. Uh, then it was um, King Dower, is that correct? Charles Flowers. Uh -huh. And, and now, now uh, Brian, yeah. Sonia Wallace. I feel like I'm in great company with all of those people. <laughs> I love it. In 2020, you received the COLA um, Fellowship, the City of Los Angeles Individual Artist uh, Fellowship. And then something that I'm very intrigued by is that in 2011, you started the Gay Rub, uh, which is uh, rubbings from LGTB+, historical markers, signs, and gravestones. And one example of that work is, uh, is in the book. Is the, I think it's the, the rubbing from David's uh, gravestone, is that correct? Correct. How could you describe the, the Gay Rub and what was the motivation behind the project? The Gay Rub is a collaborative art project of collecting rubbings of LGBTQ landmarks. And what inspired me is that in West Hollywood, just down the street from my house, is the first plaque for transgender victims of hate crimes. And when I found that out, I thought, wow, if that's the first, how many others are out there in the world and what do they look like? And I it was just, it was like that, it was just such a flash of an idea of, I should, I should collect rubbings of them. I should collect rubbings of these markers. And, you know, most of us have markers in our towns denoting like the founder of the town or something really historic that happened. But how much attention do LGBTQ people and events get? And, you know, the, the name, the gay rub is so um, memorable and <laughs> purposely evocative. But also like it's, I feel like it's just the name a poet would give a project like this, right? There's so many connotations to the word rub. Rub can mean social friction. Like you got a lot of rub for that. Mm -hmm. Rub can mean um, it's, you know, it's also slang for sexual activity, like rub one out. But also rub means erased, you know, meaning like how gay people have been erased out of history. Also gay, rub is short for rubbing. And so that's how the project just came about. What's shocked me is how many places the exhibition has traveled. And it's so beautiful to see all of these rubbings in, in one gallery space. It's interesting who gets omitted from markers and, how, and who gets included. There are a lot of markers for Tennessee Williams and Harvey mm -hmm. Milk, not so much for Marsha P. Johnson, right? And so I think there's a conversation that can happen out of that alone, but with the gay rub and also a quilt for David, what I'm doing is giving attention to things that haven't been receiving attention. It's, it's commemoration, it's kind of honoring people's lives. And when I found out where David was buried, which I was such, it was so hard to find out that information. I, I then brought my rubbing supplies and so um, I did a rubbing of his grave marker, and that an image of that is in the book. Two years, 10 months, and 29 days from diagnosis to death, David kept practicing, retired at 40 to die, from diagnosis to death, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality, retired at 40 to die. He used an alias at doctor's offices hours away from his home, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. He used an alias at doctor's office hours away from his home. Kimberly, secretly sexually active, points her finger at David. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. She pointed her finger at him. From diagnosis to death was two years, 10 months, and 29 days. Uh, you conducted uh, the first autobiographical poetry workshop for LGBT plus seniors 
Uh, and then I think, as, I don't know if it was a culmination of the project, uh, it was this, uh, this book, My Life is uh, Poetry. Could you talk a little bit about this, about this anthology? Yeah, I, the anthology came from the workshops and it was, that anthology actually came out the first year the workshops happened. And it's gone on now for, I think, about 16 years that I've been teaching LGBTQ elders. And, you know, I had, I had actually taught workshops for LGBTQ youth groups around the country. And I had some experiences and it made me think about our elders. And as the baby boomer generation was getting older, I thought like we're in such a youth worshiping culture <laughs> that what, you know, I was really interested in their stories. Also, as we age, um, that affects our energy level, our physicality. And, you know, the task of writing a complete memoir is quite a challenge. But, you know, a poetry, if, you know, if we, if we do a, a poem well, you know, all we need is that, that thin slice yeah, of yeah. cake and we know what the rest of the cake tastes like. And so that's, what I, that's why I wanted it to be autobiographical poetry, that I wanted them to write from their experiences. And there's also, you know, as we get older, I think it's very rewarding to look back and reflect on our lives. You also can create a, a different narrative or one that's a little bit more digestible. Hmm. And and also, I think it's great that these stories get to be shared with others. Because if you think about the media, how often do we truly hear from LGBTQ elders? Let's um, hear the poem that includes the, the word quilt that also appears in the, in the title. I'd sew a quilt for you. I would grab a needle, put the thread in my mouth, moisten the fibers together. I'd pierce into the eye. I'd hem, backstitch, side stitch, a remembrance of you. I put your name in large letters, wanting no one to forget that you died of it too. I'd sew you into that larger quilt because no one else has. I'd select patterns, design a quilt representing your lifelong loves. Kimberly has four panels, photos, and a large starfish. I'd sew for you thimble on my thumb. I'd push the threaded needle through the fabric. If I'd prick my finger and bleed, I wouldn't regret a single drop of blood or effort. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very Thank much you for very having much. me.